Okay, so I have more questions, and I guess for time's sake, if we could keep them to two minutes, that would be ideal. Okay, so the first question is, do plant-based eaters or vegans have to be especially careful to get enough vitamin D, DHA, EPA, iodine, taurine, vanadium, chromium, and omega-3s? Is there any risk in getting all of these from supplements as opposed to food? That's question one. Question two is, uh, Dr. Khan, you've said, I've been inside the heart 15,000 times and I've never scooped sugar out of a blocked artery. I scoop cholesterol out of blocked arteries. Please explain this. Question three, what does the science say about fish consumption and health? Does fish raise our TMAO levels and why does this matter? Does fish have mercury in it and why does this matter? Question four. Are there any whole food, plant-based foods we should avoid, such as potatoes, certain high oxalate green vegetables, nightshade vegetables, peanuts, cashews, which supposedly are not really raw because they have to be heated because that's how they get them. Um, Brian Clement from Hippocrates says black beans are very hybridized and very hard to digest. People have been saying brown rice is grown in areas where there's high arsenic. So are there any whole food plant-based diets that are not on your list to say go ahead with? Question five, how do you prevent and treat urinary tract infections? And question six, um, it was said, uh, 21 international organizations, including the World Health Organization, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, Institute of medicine all say eat as little saturated fat as possible. They couldn't be more clear, and these are highbrow organizations not associated with the vegan movement. 21 out of 21 groups say the same thing. Please explain this a little more. So one more time, first question was on the supplements, second was Dr. Khan, third was on fish and TMAO, fourth was on whole food plant-based foods that we might want to avoid, fourth was your, fifth was urinary tract infections, and the sixth was the 21 out of 21 groups. I'll go first, and I want to talk about the um, foods to avoid. The, the first thing is this issue of hybridization comes up a lot. And if you were to go to the grocery store and say, I would like for you to point me in the direction of the area of the produce section where the non-hybridized foods are, there are none. And this is a good thing for the most part. In fact, the reason why there was a potato famine that killed a million people in Ireland was because there was only one kind of potato that was grown there and had they been hybridizing potatoes and there were lots of varieties of potatoes, people would have just eaten the potatoes that weren't hit by the blight, all right? And so um, hybridization has been going on since the beginning of agriculture and breeding plants together like tomatoes with tomatoes and soybeans with soybeans to come up with bigger tomatoes, like my father, after he retired, got involved with the OSU horticulture department. He got a master's degree in horticulture. And they were breeding something that ended up being the mortgage lifter tomato. This guy invented it because he lost his job and he helped pay off his mortgage with these tomatoes. But anyway, they were, they were designed to be like the size of a slice of bread so that you'd have one slice of tomato that really held its form. And, cool. and there's, yeah, it was cool. And there's nothing the matter that tasted really great. So, so the first thing is, discarding a food because it's hybridized, you've got nothing left to eat. We need to hope that there are new hybridized foods coming out all the time that can meet the needs of the population around the world. The problem is people confuse this with genetic modification and they're not the same thing. All right, that's not the same thing. Um, I think the, the biggest, without going into all these individual foods, because Steve wants to keep us to two minutes and we're doing such a good job following your directions, have you noticed that? Um, but the, the problem with the foods to avoid list is that this goes back to this one size fits all. I mean, people write books about gluten is bad. Well, you know what? If you have celiac disease, it's really bad, all right? And if you have certain types of autoimmune disease, it's probably good to stay away at least from high gluten foods, but not the rest of the world. If you go into anaphylactic shock when you're exposed to peanuts, you should not eat them, but I don't, and so there's no reason for me to not have peanut butter once in a while. So I think it's very important that we not try to come up with hit lists of plant foods that we're not supposed to eat, because most people can eat most of them without any problem at all. So first of all, if you have a food allergy, I mean, if you eat strawberries and your tongue swells up and you can't swallow, do not eat them, all right? But that's not an indictment of strawberries and everybody should stay away from them. So uh, in the interest of time, I won't say more, but there's lots more to the topic. Okay. 
I'll take fish for 400. <laughs> I, when, when, when patients or conference attendees ask me the question, well, what about fish? Uh, if I'm feeling flippant, I'll say, well, what about them? But the question I typically ask them, I said, let's say you were someone or an animal that had to eat lungs. That's all you could eat. Would you eat the lungs of an animal raised in a coal mine? And everybody scratches up their face, of course not, because it'd be filthy. They'd be full of coal dust and tar and God knows what else. Well, the oceans are filthy. They are loaded. We dump sewage and all sorts of industrial wastes and toxins in them, and fish have to filter that to breathe. So fish tissue is actually some of the animal tissue that has the highest loads of toxins of anything someone can put in their body. So that is a problem, and it's not just the mercury. It's also PCBs, it's uh, pesticide residues, I mean, you name it, on and on down the line. But also, because of all of the fertilizers we are dumping into the oceans, we are creating these algae blooms that, where these toxic algae uh, blooms release these toxins into the water that are also taken up by fish. And studies have shown that people from certain areas who eat a lot of fish are at higher risk for developing what is colloquially known as Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. It's what uh, um, uh, Stephen Hawking had. It's a generally a relentlessly debilitating and ultimately fatal neurologic disease. And there's also some suggestion from certain studies that these uh, algal toxins are also related to Parkinson's and possibly dementia risk. But the bottom line is fish flesh is animal flesh. And as Garth has pointed out, as we've talked already, Higher intakes of animal tissue correlate with increased mortality, a higher risk for cancer because it turns on cancer genes. Not to mention the fact that it, you have all of the uh, uh, um, cancer-causing compounds that comes from cooking the fish. And then, of course, it does increase TM TAMO, uh, which is another toxin. And so the bottom line is let the fish swim and be happy and eat your plants. I don't, I, I don't feel strongly about it. How do I treat UTIs with antibiotics? Is, yep, thank you. That's there actually was a report in the last two weeks, again, of lower UTI rates in vegetarians. I didn't read the study in detail. And some of it is handling the chicken in the kitchen and the same oh, yeah, E. coli there was a lot that, handling that strains. Yeah. Exactly. So. But I, I guess, and, and let me some, just build a second. some preventive value from cranberry, from cranberry juice. There's, yeah, preventive value. But to effect. treat an infection, again, I think I, I mentioned this a bit on my talk today. Don't, food is medicine, but it is not the only medicine. And there will be times that we need Lipitor, and there are times that we need antibiotics. And I have seen some very, very sick people who refused to use medicines until it was almost too late. So... Don't get into that idea that Western medicine is absolutely terrible. It's not. It's good at sick care. It's not good at health care, but it's good at sick care. Yeah, agreed. I made the same point earlier. Yeah, yeah we, we, have, we have the opportunity to rely on diet and lifestyle as primary medicine, and everyone can benefit, and then a lot fewer of us will need a lot fewer medications. But when we happen to need one, it's a good thing that we have them. Rates of stroke have declined primarily because of effective treatment of hypertension, which is genetic. Sometimes some people eat optimally, they're still hypertensive. Effective drugs that they tolerate well may be the difference between having a stroke and not. So yeah, I completely agree there. Uh, there are only a couple questions left. I guess one of the remaining ones was that um, 21 of 21 august organizations cite a link between higher intake of saturated fat and higher rates of heart disease and other bad stuff. Uh, yeah, that's because it's true. That's it. No, I wanted to say something about the UTIs. I'm responsible. Yeah, no, so, uh, you know, I'm being a little bit glib, but, you know, for example, um, last night on the panel, Colin, uh, you know, I think argued against saturated fat, placing the, the emphasis on animal protein. I, I'm a pragmatist, 
So, you know, yes, I do believe the evidence regarding the mechanistic adverse effects of saturated fat. I also believe the mechanistic adverse effects of animal protein. But we eat foods. And, and the simple fact is that we get our excess of animal protein and our excess of saturated fat from all the same sources. I think one of the ways to sidestep a lot of unnecessary controversy, generate a lot more light and quite a bit less heat, is to talk about foods, which I think is the native predisposition of this group anyway, when we say whole food, plant-based, we're talking about whole foods. Okay, then what are the foods? Diets made up predominantly or exclusively of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, and water when you're thirsty. And then, frankly, you're avoiding the animal protein, you're avoiding the saturated fat, you fix a host of ills. Fixate on any one nutrient, there are still ways to get the foods wrong. And you know, let's be clear, you could be strictly vegan on a diet of Coca-Cola and cotton candy. That wouldn't make it a good idea, right? So saturated fat's not the only thing wrong. Get the foods right, the nutrients tend to sort themselves out. I just wanted to add something about the UTIs, and that is that um, I agree, you have a UTI, you give an antibiotic, but we get people in our office who have six UTIs a year and they take antibiotics again and again, and nobody ever stops to say, why do you keep getting these UTIs? And so, um, and, and plus, you, know, you do this for three or four years, and antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections are life-threatening, and we have to be more conscious of that, I think, in medicine. Um, so you can deal with UTIs a little bit differently, and you have to. By the time somebody's had 24 rounds of antibiotics, that's not fixing anything, and in fact, the next one comes more often. So we look at hydration, we look, at, um, uh, we look at using plant antimicrobials and uh, with very high dose probiotics to restore, um, to, to address the infection without more antibiotics um, and also to restore the immune system, which has been completely wiped out, or the microbiome, which has been completely wiped out and it adds increased susceptibility. And then um, high, using cranberry juice, not from concentrate, uh, with, mixed in with raw honey, because raw honey has antibacterial properties, and there are studies in medical journals about this. So drinking cranberry juice, you have to sweeten it with something anyway, or it'll, your lips will wrap right around the bottle, it's so sour. <laughs> so, so if you do these things, it takes some time, but we have people who've had f five to six uh, UTIs a year for five and six years and wiped it out like they never have another one again. And so I think one time, Antibiotic, don't worry about it, but if it's repetitive, you have to say something's going on here, and before we uh, really make, do some damage with the antibiotics, we should look at why and fix that. Uh, just a quick thing on the saturated fat, because it comes up a lot, and you'll, you will hear about the study, which was called the Siri Torino study, which was the study that really started all the saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. It was sponsored by industry, as you might imagine. But they did a kind of a simple trick. They, they, they took a bunch of different, it was a meta-analysis, they looked at a bunch of different studies. You gotta understand that these studies, they're trying to show a relation between saturated fat or lack of relation between saturated fat and heart disease. They controlled for independent risk factors of heart disease, one of those being cholesterol. So you understand the problem here. If you control for cholesterol, one of the methods that saturated fat causes heart disease is by raising cholesterol. So again, if I take this big group of people and I say everybody in you that are out here that have high cholesterol, leave the room, I've kind of eliminated all the people that are being affected by saturated fat. And so therefore, I'm kind of you know, you know, making the game play in my favor, which is what they did with that study and how we started with this whole weight, saturated fat isn't bad for you. 